Hi, this is Nick Dawson, the editor in chief of Talkhouse Film, and you're listening to the Talkhouse Film podcast. James Marsh was on the podcast last week, talking with Laura Poitras about her incredible Edward Snowden doc, Citizen Four. Marsh is best known as a documentarian for films such as Man on Wire and Project Nim, but he's also a gifted director of fiction films. And this week he's back, talking about the theory of everything, his film about Stephen Hawking and his first wife Jane, starring Eddie Redmayne and Felicity Jones, which is released November 7. From the start, there was only one person who I wanted to pair with Marsh for a conversation about his new movie, Errol Morris. Not only is he a towering figure within non-fiction filmmaking and, like Marsh, an Academy Award winner, but he's also made a film about Hawking, The Excellent A Brief History of Time, which was earlier this year re-released by the Criterion Collection. And, of course, he's fearsomely smart and a highly entertaining raconteur. So... Settle in for a fascinating conversation which encompasses everything from the serial killer Ed Gein and Sawney Bean, the Scottish cannibal who preyed on tax collectors, to why Errol Morris did not smash in Donald Rumsfeld's head with a brick, and, of course, Stephen Hawking, about whom both men have great stories. So, so Errol, let me, let me just uh, preface this conversation with just, I'm a little nervous about this because of, um, I kind of exist, I think, somewhat within your shadow in terms of documentary filmmaking. And when I saw The Thin Blue Line, I was a young, uh, quite young filmmaker. I'd made two little shorts, and it could have changed everything about how I approached my work. So it was a, that was a kind of my eureka moment in filmmaking, hence my nervousness about this. Um, and, and secondly, I, I bring in your film. I, I think it's one of your best, if not my favourite of yours, uh, in terms of the, you know, the, all the work that I've seen of yours. So... That's why I was keen to have this conversation. And I just, I realized as I was starting on theory, I, I had this Dutch kind of, not bootleg copy, but a Dutch copy of the film. And by the time I got to the end of the shooting, I think Criterion had released a rather, a rather lovely version of it, which I guess is out in the world now. So it feels like a good time to talk about that, that film, if you're okay with that. Sure. I'm also quite happy to talk about your films as well, because I've had a connection with them in many different ways over the years. Um, You may or may not know this, but I was an undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison years ago. And... Oh, how interesting. One of the people that I knew, uh, I was an undergraduate, he was a graduate student in history, was Michael Lessing. Yes, indeed. I actually just spoke to Michael this weekend. We've, we've kept in touch over the years. So I guess he was beginning his, his thesis, which became a constant death trip. Yes. And that book and the history of that book is an extraordinary story in and of itself. It certainly is. Um, I mean, I've actually you know, had the pleasure of handling those glass plate negatives myself. They're all actually, I mean, you may, may have done this yourself too. They're all there and you can actually get them and from the library system and, and actually have them. These, the big sort of glass plate, they're extraordinary. Uh, and the quality of them is better than anything that we, we've yet to, I think, come up with in terms of um, you know, the visual quality of those glass plate negatives. That just, they're just amazing. And there's things, they're just beautiful things in themselves, these sort of tactile things. So that's an interesting connection. Did you ever get tempted to to make a film about the book. Obviously I did, but in a sense, was that something that, that crossed your mind at any point as you began making films? Well, wait a second. You weren't just tempted to make a film. If I memory did. serves me correctly, it, you it actually was, did make one. It was a long and, and very, it was very handmade, that film. It was, it was a group of people who sort of gathered at irregular intervals with a bit of money and then increasingly less money to do this sort of handmade film um, and so, I, yes, indeed, I did, did indeed make the film and tried to find a way of you know, translating what appeared initially to be an almost impossible book to kind of capture the, just the energy of it and the, the way it, uh, and the, you know, the, the mixed media and how you went to that as a, as a film. And I'm not sure I, I got it right, but it's certainly, Michael actually really liked the film when he, when he saw it, which was passing the most important test of all, because he's quite a, you know, he's a real academic. He's very... Um, obsessed with with detail as he should be uh, and so he he's he's he liked the film a lot and that that made it all sort of worthwhile I, you know i, I don't I haven't seen that, that that film for so long hey I, wait a second here 
I don't like the book, and I do like the film. How interesting. That's that, What an interesting thing to say. Um, so w w you must have seen the book more or less when it came out, because I, I came to it a bit later, because I'm a bit younger than you. I saw the book before it came out. Oh, really? Um, I saw it when it was in various stages um, of production, because, and I haven't seen the book in years and years and years, um, it was very much a, a book of collage. Mm, exactly. Uh, Michael had collaged a lot of the photographs, uh, which is something I never, I never saw the necessity of doing that because the photographs, the Van Schack photographs, are really so incredible in and of themselves. And if memory also serves me correctly, the curator at the Wisconsin State Historical Society, Paul Vanderbilt, was never really given much credit. No, he wasn't. And um, he, he looms behind that book and indeed that whole collection. Um, Michael's quite generous about him, I think, in the book and in the introduction. But I think that he obviously led Michael to many of his discoveries. Then there's another thing that fascinates me. I'm babbling here, so you can stop me at any time. I'm enjoying this. Rather, rather you than me babbling. Your babble's uh, more interesting than mine. Um, a friend of mine who's a photographer often talks about the Wisconsin death trip effect. And by that he means that you have all of these photographs. These are, by and large, uh, people of Scandinavian extraction, uh, Black River Falls, Wisconsin. And they all have blue eyes. Or let's just say a lot of them have mm. blue eyes. And still do when you go up there. And probably still do. Um, they're, uh, they're heirs. And at that time, in the mid-19th century, Photographic emulsions could not record blue. Uh, I didn't they, know. They could not record blue, and so uh, what does blue end up as? It ends up as white. Oh, of course. Okay, that's interesting. Now I, I can see the how this adds a certain unintentional sinister quality to the images. It, it gives the image, I, I guess, the idea is that it gives the images this, this feeling, um, you said sinister, it, sinister seems right, why quibble? Uh, it, it makes people look mad. Well also they're doing long exposures, so they have to stand there for 10 seconds and stare into the camera. It's not like a, a photograph you take now which happens immediately, it, it's, a, it's a long exposure. And that's why the quality is so interesting because they, the exposure is so long, you get this extraordinary detailed image, but again that compounds this sort of slightly, you know, demonic quality that people staring at a camera with white eyes creates. By the way, I really like the concept of slightly demonic. Yes, it is an interesting concept that one that I when I should I should work on more. So back to my question, which you've very successively evaded. Which is, did you ever Thank feel you wanted to make a film about? Did, was that anything that ever crossed your mind that that book as a as a film project, as a as a film that you might make? Well, I had so many Wisconsin projects in those days. Well, I guess you did, didn't you? Of course. I lived in a small town in the middle of Wisconsin, Plainfield. Uh, that was with, a very interesting choice of, of where to live. With it. Well, it's a... Probably a conscious one, maybe. A very conscious choice because yeah. I was obsessed with this grave robber and mass murderer, Ed Gein. And so I lived with Ed Gein's neighbors. Uh, no longer lived in Plainfield. They lived just south of Plainfield in a small town, Hancock, Wisconsin. But um, no, I, I was never tempted by, by the book. But again, I really, really like the film. I think the film is beautifully photographed and evocative. Um, well, we, we just we just obviously you know took the 
the, the photographs as a starting point for what we did. And as I said, it was handmade, so we, we weren't watching dailies. And we did this very radical exposure at the point of shooting, then underdeveloped the film, um, which we didn't know what, what we were getting at this point because we, we couldn't you know, see what, it was a very cheap production. So we shot the first two weeks, those reconstructions, in this sort of very cavalier way of this radical exposure, overexposure at the point of shooting and under underdeveloping it. And the DP said to me at the end of this, well, we may have nothing at the end of these two weeks, I just don't know. But thankfully we did have something and that became the sort of starting point for this four year kind of odyssey where I go back and I went all over Wisconsin. Um, didn't go to Plainfield oddly enough, went, went to many other small and quite strange places. Um, so. Plainfield isn't the kind of place where you would go unless you really... Was seeking it out. Well, I, I should have sorted it out, really. Um, That's correct. This is in the sort of... I was doing this in the sort of hinterland of Jeffrey Dahmer uh, in Milwaukee, so that, that he was he was the, the contemporary version of Ed Gein, I guess, at that point um, in time. It's, by the way, it's not German. It's Scottish. It's shortened from McGean. So the oh, is that right? pronunciation is not the German one. How interesting! He's sorry so, to go pedantic. Well, on you know, you. well, you know that you know you probably know about the great Scottish cannibal Sawney Bean. Do yes. you know about him? Um, who would sort of he would uh, capture and eat tax inspectors from England. It uh, seems like a worthy enterprise. Exactly, and drag them off to caves and eat them. What a good way of dealing, dealing with your with your tax returns. Um, so, but Errol, can I talk a bit about brief history of time with you? Because as I said, it is one of my favourite, if not my favourite, film of yours, and. Um, it, what, what it allowed me to do in my film was, I, I'm pointing people in the direction of this film a lot as I talk about my film, because mine has a, a conspicuous absence of science and, and a sort of straight biography of Stephen. It's really about, you know, the great absence in your film, perhaps, is, is Jane Hawking. And of course, what, what I'm now saying to people as often as I can is, well, guess what? You know, that film has been made. The story of Stephen's ideas in relation to his life has been made very, very well already. So go and look at that, which gives me permission to do my film in a way, which is really from Jane's perspective. Um, and one of the things that struck me when I first, I saw the film in England on television. I recorded it on a VHS tape, as you could do in those days. And I'm guessing it, you were making it around the time that Stephen and Jane were separating. Would that be right? That's absolutely correct. So that would explain her absence, which I never really noticed at all when I first saw the film. But of course, when I came to look at Stephen's life and Jane's biography, I began to put that together. Oh, well, that, that, that seems to explain why Jane wasn't in the film. Did you, did you meet with Jane? Um, I did indeed. I uh, made repeated efforts to get her uh, in the movie. I very, very much wanted to do an interview and I went over to her house one evening in Cambridge and she was living with a musician. Jonathan, yes, who, who she ended up marrying, Jonathan Hellyer Jones, who's a character in our story, one in her life too, of course. And I told them that I was a cellist and I hope you were a cellist. That's extraordinary. Oh, did, 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 they, did they set you a test or something? They did indeed. Oh, goodness me. How did you fare? Um, not as well as I might have liked. I had not been really... It's no interview then, right? Practicing a lot. They had a cello. Um, they had a copy of the Foray Elegy. And... They asked me to play the 4A Allergy. Oh, my goodness. Um, I wish they'd asked me now because I've been practicing a lot. Um, and so I, I did my best. It's not that easy, really. It's, in fact, really hard to play. No, I, well. I, I know the piece. And um, if you were sort of out of practice and you're in front of a... a Jonathan's an academic. I mean, he's a, that's what he does. He's, he studies music and he's a, a choir master and an organist of some repute in Cambridge. So um, you, you couldn't have asked for a sterner test of your musical abilities than that. And I, and I guess, um, and how did it go? Did, did they, were they complimentary or? I didn't get the interview. I didn't get the interview, that, that we do know. Uh, what a shame.
When I first thought that I was making a film about brief history of time, uh, I was reluctant. Maybe I'm reluctant about everything. But I felt that making a movie about science wasn't really something that interested me. Uh, I had been a, a graduate student at Princeton in history and philosophy of science. And oh, I, I didn't know that. So you brought some sort of academic sort of context, as it were, to what you were doing, which I lack conspicuously. Um, something like that. Um, and I used to say that uh, whatever movies are, they're not a really good place to teach general relativity and cosmology. That, that is my mantra every time I talk to anyone about this, is that, you know, you're sort of asking them the medium. But, but what you seem to do in the film, if I can distill it from the way I, what I, was you managed to quite successfully connect the biography with the ideas. Um, but this is what's so odd about that book. And I think the book is an extraordinary book, an extraordinarily strange book, and a book that really is misunderstood. Um, it goes, for the most part, like many books, unobserved. Uh, I never had any interest in doing psychobiography. Um, and I never had any interest in relating uh, intellectual biography to the, the details of someone's life. I was flying uh, from, I live in what Stephen Hawking calls the pseudo Cambridge, Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> I was flying to the real Cambridge to uh, meet Stephen Hawking for the first time. I'm reading the book on the plane and I thought, oh my God, it's not me connecting science and biography, it's Stephen Hawking. In the book. The whole book mm -hmm. is Stephen Hawking's attempt to tell his own life story through his work. Did you put and, that to him? A, a number of times, because there was horrible tension between us through the entire making of the movie because he kept saying, I don't want a biography, I just want a book about my science. And I said, well, then you shouldn't have written a book about your biography oh, okay. and your science. And did he, did he finally, that? finally, when he saw the film, which was at the old CAA offices in Beverly Hills, he came out of the screening, and the first thing he said to me is, thank you for making my mother a star. Oh, how brilliant. And um, it meant a lot to me. I guess a lot to him as well, because um, she really is, you know, she's such a... Uh, uh, she is a star. She is a star, exactly. take you to make the thin blue lines going back that quickly? A long time because I wasn't just making a film, I was investigating a murder case or if you ah. like a series of murder mm. cases mm. so that part of it was investigative, part of it was making a film uh, the series of interviews that I did and then part of it was turning it into a movie etc cetera, etc. Cetera. It took a long time it took too damn long Everything takes too long. I had that experience with Death Trip that took, that took from the moment I got the first idea of war. You know, I really, I should say how much I like your films and, um, and how much I've really thought about them over the years. And, and there are all kinds of questions I have. You have questions for me. I have questions for you. Um, one of the things that... that I suppose fascinates me, and I don't know why it fascinates me. I think it's sort of the pedant in, in me. Um, is this endless question, 
with documentary about the relationship of the film to reality, such as it is. And uh, I had seen Nim, and Nim made me very, very, very jealous because I used to say I wanted to make a film that would make people wish they had never been born. <laughs> and I felt Nim came closer to that goal than anything that I had been able to achieve. It certainly was, you know, as you began to grope into this, um, you know, your regard for your own species gets diminished incremental on a daily basis. Yeah, um, my, my, and, my species sucks. Yeah, that, that was, so that's basically the, the sort of the, if there was one moral in the film, that's what it was for sure. Um, and that, that was, I guess, uh, t the Professor Terrace, when I, when I met him, uh, and it was interesting as a, also as a, as a background to the, to the theory of everything and the, the world of science in, in that film too. But, um, it, it is, it is, you know, it's one of those remarkable stories that I was fortunate enough to get my hands on. And of course, then we were blessed with this amazing archive that I didn't know existed. His first encounter with a, with a real chimpanzee was shot by a news crew. And that was just, it was just such an amazing moment when I saw that footage, all these sort of nasty 16 mil kind of blotchy images. But there is Nim, who's not seen a chimpanzee ever, apart from his mother, probably for, for six days or three days or whatever it was. And then he has to encounter this other chimp. And that, that is just the most, most amazing moments I've seen it on any film. Not because it was, you know, in my story, but it just is the most profound encounter. You've got a chimpanzee who's been conditioned to think that he's something and he sees what he really is. And he's terrified of what he is and tries to, tries to use all the human strategies he's learned to communicate with that chimpanzee and relate to that other chimpanzee. The other chimpanzee just, just beats him up. <laughs> you know, that's, that's his response to, to, to Nim, is, is, is to savage him. Um, but you mentioned that that whole relationship between, you know, documentary and reality, and it, it was what Wiseman said something that I always, always remember and always use, I guess, for myself, is that he called his work reality fiction. And Wiseman is working in a much more observational, I guess, mode than you and I. And he says that about his work. And I felt that sort of is, is the best sort of label that I can find in two words for, I guess, what we're doing. Um, would, you, would you agree with that? Or do you, do you have a, a better version of that or a different version of that? Uh, I probably have, don't have a better version, but I have a different version. And uh, I, I should say that uh, Wiseman is one of my close friends. Uh, he is one of the reasons why I am a filmmaker. We both live here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, although he's somewhere else most of the time. Almost all the time with his camera on, exactly. Uh, and I always say to him that he is the king of misanthropic cinema, that he has made some of the most despairing, uh, expressionistic films of all time. I would stick with that, although he would respectfully disagree. Well, you've seen uh, Primate, I'm sure, which was a, you know, a key text for me making Project Nim. I've seen over 30 of them, if you can believe it. No, I can. I've seen probably 20 myself, but Primate was one of my, it's one of my favorites of his. And yes, I have seen Primate. And, and that, that, that exactly is, if you wanted to, you know, to use an example to illustrate your king of misanthropic filmmaking there it is i mean there are so many others too but that that one because it's also it's also senseless what they're doing it's all for nothing these ridiculous experiments it's just because they can do something they're just making it up as they go along with no objective whatsoever i uh, wrote this piece about fred wiseman for the museum of modern art they were doing a retrospective a couple of years ago and I said, among other things, that he had some of the most perverted sex scenes in the history of cinema. Doesn't he just? And one of them, of course, is in Primate. The... It's, it certainly is. Um, we managed to get one in Project Nim where Nim, when he's an adolescent, um, actually, you know, quite on a regular basis, tries, tries to shag a cat. And some of that's on, you know, there's a brief glimpse of that in the film.
what's absolutely certain is that you make a film and someone, at least one and probably a lot more than one, the people are going to be unhappy with it. Well, indeed, Philippe Petit was very angry with me when he first saw Man on Wire. He hated it and wrote me a very long and rather beautifully handwritten letter uh, explaining why. Um, but then to his great credit, he saw it with an audience and he quite quickly began to understand that, that the audience really liked him in the film, the way the film presented him. And so quickly pivoted to, a, you know, a, a sort of enthusiastic, in, in endorsement of the film, but he he very much took against it when he first saw it, because it wasn't only about him. I I'd, you know, had the temerity to um, to interview other people too, you know, and and find out what they saw. Um, so yes, it's it's it sort of goes with our our territory, I guess. What did um, what did Rumsfeld make of of the film? Did you ever hear back from him? This was such an odd experience because. I spent so much time with Rumsfeld, uh, a good part of a year. Oh my goodness. I interviewed for him for over 30 hours. Um, and my guess is that Rumsfeld would have continued to be interviewed by me forever. <laughs> Um, until someone just carted me <laughs> away exactly. on a, a gurney. It was um, strapped to a gurney. Um, <laughs> it's an interesting image, that, by the way. Uh, we should make that one happen sometime. Oh, it's going to. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> but there's something about this interview. I've interviewed so many, many, many people over the years, too many. Uh, Holocaust deniers, mass murderers, um, you name it. This by far was, I don't even know how to ca ca characterize it. Um, because I often think about the mystery of what is inside of people's heads, the mystery of human personality. Mm. Um, with this probably mistaken idea that if you get someone to talk a lot, they might reveal something about what goes on inside. Or well, their very evasions will reveal it in a different way, I guess. Yes. Um, here, at the end of 30 plus hours, I felt I might know less than when I started. Um, although I didn't know that there was at least that possibility that there was nothing there. Well, that, that was, if you, if you wanted to, that was my ultimate um, sort of takeaway from that film. That there was just nothing there. Um, and that was the scariest thing of all, quite honestly. Yeah, I think that's a pretty scary idea. Um, but did he, did he give you any feedback when he saw it? Um, I almost, I mean, I've never done this before. Um, I started getting reviews which said that I had not been difficult enough uh, with Rumsfeld. I kept pitching, you know, whatever the metaphor is supposed to be, softballs. Mm. Um, and I have this rule, there's no slur, insult, nasty comment that people can make that it isn't effective. And um, it started to bother me. Uh, it just bothered me. Uh, the idea was that I was, I suppose, the appropriate response for many people was that I should just have hit him with a brick. <laughs> and having failed to do that. Yes, anything else you do would, was never going to, yes, exactly. No, it's I, I had failed in my Sufficient. civic responsibilities. Yes. And, um, and I was never going to hit him with a brick. Um, first of all, I'm scared of physical violence. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> he might pick up the brick and hit me with it. You never know about these things. Or he might just sort of dust himself down and say, next question. Yes. Um, you know, um, so, like so I... I started commenting on the movie, and I should have just said nothing. 
It's a but, terrible thing that when you, I never, I've always resisted that, you know, getting into a dialogue with people who are taking issue with you. Um, you know, it's, 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 I don't know how that went, but I, something I've always managed to resist, even when I was sorely provoked on Project Nim, I thought, I just don't want to, I've well, made film, that's what it is, you know. You're a stronger man than I. Well, it's, I, quite, uh, it's quite tempting, you know, you feel like you, you're being traduced this way and, 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 you know, people's expectations of what you've done are, are totally misplaced and on and on. And, you know, I get a bit indignant about it, but at a certain point, I know that I can do nothing about it other than compound the problem by engaging with it. Um, I like that, the movie, and I, um, I think it's one of my strongest efforts, and I like it for many, 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 many reasons. But uh, my relationship with Donald Rumsfeld really came to an end really uh, when the movie was released. I haven't really gone out of my way to contact him. I'm not exactly sure what I would say. Um, McNamara was so different because we had a relationship which continued long after the completion of the movie that uh, continued almost uh, to his death mm -hmm. years later. Uh, this is different. With Rumsfeld, you know, the my feeling was that you did everything that you could do. Um, and I got the impression that, that, maybe this is wrong, but he wasn't as smart as we would like to think he was. That was another thing that I took away from that film. I think he's not as smart as he would like to think well, that, 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 That's almost a given from, <laughs> from his track record. Um, and the decisions he made sort of speak, speak, speak volumes on that score. But you know, we we always thought he was smart. These little haiku kind of comments he makes, and and the sort of baffling, you know, one-liners. Um, and there's nothing beyond that either. And they don't bear any scrutiny to either too. Unlike Stephen, or going back to Stephen, who uses language in such an interesting way when you've got so your resources so limited in terms of time. And that's one thing I wanted to ask you whilst I remember because it's it was how his, did, his use of language. I mean, I often would say about Stephen Hawking and uh, why, I, why I really, really like Stephen Hawking. Um, it, all of the ingredients uh, that uh, make me like someone, he's ridiculously smart. Um, he is really funny. One of the funniest people that I have ever met. And he's incredibly perverse. Um, and yes, it's a great, there's a great, that's a great combination, isn't it? Oh, it is. It's a fantastic combination. I'll tell you a couple of lines. Because um, we had set up in this uh, faux office at Elstree, and I put all these Bert Stern photographs of Marilyn Monroe up on the wall. Which one is real office to this day, in fact. Yes. And... Um, at a certain point, well, we hadn't glued the pictures, the hooks, well enough onto the wall. And during one take, uh, Marilyn Monroe, the photograph of Marilyn Monroe, clattered to the floor. And uh, Stephen Hawking was clicking away and, and said, a fallen woman. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> I said to him, I remember this one time, maybe this was my epiphany. I said, you know, I finally have figured out why you like Marilyn Monroe so much. Um, and so he looks at me. <laughs> and, um, and I said, like yourself, here is a person appreciated more for her body than for her mind. <laughs> exactly right. It's and, true. It's, it's and he, and he, he looked at me again, this weird look, and then finally there's this pause. He said, yes. Yes, his timing is impeccable too, and how he, when he times his responses, because it was all within his control. How did you find, I mean, I think he's obviously quite a lot slower now. He has a little chip in his uh, glasses that he uses. Yes. Um, but I guess this is 1990, maybe 1989, 1990. Um, he was probably a bit quicker, if not quite a bit quicker with his, you know, but how do you find that, you know, you ask him a question, you say something, 
And then you have to wait. In this case, when I met him, literally 10 minutes. Uh, and how do you then handle, how did you handle the protocol? Maybe the gap wasn't quite so long. But it's like nothing else you ever ever had to, to kind of deal with in terms of interacting with another human being. What did you do in that gap, that, that five minute gap or whatever it was? It, well, when the, you first, were... the first time that I had met him, which was at his office as a damped, uh, in Cambridge, and the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. Um, to me, it, it was almost psychiatric in this sense. That you are seated across from someone, you say something, and then there is this excruciatingly long pause uh, that goes on for seems like hours, it's a matter of minutes, but it's this long pause. You can hear the clicking, but before you've spent any time with Hawking, you don't really know what's going on. You're not really privy to the whole apparatus mm. of how he communicates. And you're forced back on yourself. You don't know whether he wants you to leave <laughs> or whether he's answering your question or you don't know. You have no idea what's going on. And then finally there's a beep and which indicates that he's finished writing and that he's sent what he's written to the voice synthesizer uh, to be spoken. After I got to know him better, uh, he would let me sit next to him while he was writing, so you could read the screen. But then you have to, then that's a very different form of communication too. You, you, you're sort of anticipating what he's going to say at that point. You're saying, well, you say part of a sentence, and then it's the game of filling out the filling sentence. It. Yeah, which is, is a, another form of strange interactive protocol. And but it's keep... fun. It actually is fun. Okay, is he didn't, I didn't, I didn't have to... Yeah, what's That's the next word better. going to be? Or exactly. how is he going to complete the sentence? There's real tension in that moment. Um, which I rather I rather enjoyed sitting next to him. It was it I didn't was, have the presumption to do that. You, but it I, was fun. I mean, I just there's so many hawking stories, it's hard to know where to begin. I did get to know him at all well. I mean, I met him when we brought the script to him and we had that strange encounter in his his office in Cambridge. And he came to set one very early on when we were shooting. Um, and I think he enjoyed it. You know, we gave him some champagne and he enjoyed the spectacle of being there. And he, he arrived in this extraordinary way. We were doing these, there's a big fireworks, a May ball sequence. And there's a big firework display. And he arrives, you know, I'm sure he was waiting for that. And then he arrives just as that's happening. And I've got this very strong image of him arriving. That screen lights his face. It was very dark. And there's this, this, this big, bright screen in front of him with this sort of weird glow onto this half man, I guess, half robot. And these other literally six people, not tethered to him, but they kind of were with invisible lines like his, like his body, like that whole entity moving towards us, these five carers that were there. It was the most extraordinary thing. Um, and then I met him again. And we showed him the film uh, when the film was more or less done. And again, wasn't able to have any proper conversation. But clearly you, you did and you had a relationship that was, I mean, much more substantial than mine is with him. Let me ask you this, one, as someone that thought about this a lot, what, what did you end up thinking about the origins of the universe? I mean, it's in the film to some extent. But did you, did you go on and think about that some more? Because um, I found myself having these quite scary and troubling thoughts, you know, late night in hotels about all this. But what was your, what was your, if, if I can ask you that question, and you know, and you can give me a, a sort of short answer. What was your, where, where did you end up with that question, or where have you ended up with that question? It's an odd thing to ask. Um, I, I've always assumed that the origins and the death of the universe are far enough removed from the here and now that I don't have to really worry about them. Well, I began to worry about them. That's why I asked you the question as I was doing the, my film. Uh, um, I mean, this is a long, long extended conversation about how I feel about Hawking's various explanations for the origins of the universe. I once asked him, we were on set at Elstree, 
uh, I always was afraid, and for good reason, I might add, that he would think I was an idiot. I might be an idiot. <laughs> so I could very well be an idiot. And um, so I was, I was joking with him, and I said, you know, I know that, that nothing can escape from a black hole. There's the event horizon. Mm. Um, but, and we can't see beyond that event horizon into the interior of a black hole. But what if we could? Now, 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 I know we can't, mm. but what if we could? What do you think we might see? And so then there was this long pause, the clicking, and then finally the beep uh, signal that he was about to speak. Um, and he said, seven leather-bound volumes of Proust. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad they were leather-bound. Um, knowing how much every letter it takes them to do, I'm glad they were leather-bound. That's, so, that, that's brilliant. Um, extraordinary. This is Nick Dawson from TalkHouse Film, and you've been listening to Al Morris and James Marsh in conversation on the TalkHouse Film podcast. The episode was engineered and edited by Elia Einhorn. For more filmmakers talking film and TV, visit thetalkhouse.com slash film. Subscribe to TalkHouse Film and TalkHouse Music Podcasts on iTunes, where you can find all our previous episodes. And while you're there, please rate and review if you can. I don't even know why I'm saying this. I should probably say nothing. I should probably say nothing about everything. I'd be better off. <laughs> <laughs>